Great. All right, Stephanie, take it away. All right. Welcome, welcome, everyone. I am here with Millicent. So excited to have you. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm good. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, we got a chance to touch base like I do with all of our special guests, and we're going to dive right into the journey. So let us know what state you're from and when you were at University of Michigan. Okay, um, I am from Michigan. I'm from the Lansing area, and I was at UMich from 2008 to 2012. Awesome. And <laughs> what things did you study while you were there? Um, I actually um, dabbled in a little bit of everything. Like I didn't have necessarily a set interest when I came in. Um, I just knew I loved everything kind of creative and I did fibers, printmaking, furniture making. I kind of loved all of it. <laughs> nice. So. Do you have a class that stood out to you? Um, I loved, I mean, I, Sherry Smith is gone, retired now, I think, but I loved fibers with Sherry Smith. Yeah. Um, I also loved, um, taking classes from Matchline. Um, I think I had TMP one with him. I can't remember, but. Can you tell us what's Matchline? Oh, Matchline. Uh, I think there's a, the professor or the instructor match line. I think he's maybe oh, oh, okay, okay. Yeah. And uh, the name it, didn't sound familiar to me. <laughs> sorry. He, no, that's okay. he actually um he he did just he was a really interesting um instructor and he had kind of a lot of interesting prompts for projects. So for example, one time we made font out of um photography and like we we took pictures oh, cool. of things to make it font and I made like a font out of sushi at the time or um, I like folded money, like origami almost into like okay. letter shapes, like just a lot of kind of interesting, fun work that I hadn't, wouldn't, I mean, it, it was just kind of interesting prompts and things I probably wouldn't have done on my own. Yeah, that makes sense. Very cool. <laughs> now, right prior to you, you went straight from high school to undergrad, is that correct? I did. Yeah, I, I did. Um, I technically was considered a transfer student. Um, I, long story short, my parents were planning to move my senior year of high school and I didn't want to do a new high school like my senior yeah. year. Yes. So I actually graduated one semester early from high school oh, wow. and then I took classes at my community college just for one semester and then because of that, I was technically considered a transfer student, but gotcha. I mean, pretty much I was the same age as everyone else. And yeah. yeah, that makes so. sense. Very cool. So um, just wanting to talk a little bit more about like your senior year experience while you were at Stamps. Um, oh yeah, my, uh, so I mean, it was definitely probably a little bit different than most people's experiences. Um, I like had a kind of an unexpected loss um, of my some family members of mine. And um, I actually dropped all of my classes besides IP. So oh. I got to focus only on IP just because I was a little overwhelmed at the time to kind of do other things at the same time. And um, I kind of just like dove a hundred and fifty percent just into my IP to just kind of get through that year. Um, yeah. But I did printmaking and um, carving of wood and I kind of got into these very like tedious nature patterns. Mm. Um, and I just spent hours and hours doing these like little fine line drawings and turning them into prints and things like that. So wow. what was your final kind of presentation like? Um, it was, I mean, it was a series of probably, it was kind of like a cluster of maybe a hundred prints and then a giant, um, I had bought this like large pocket door secondhand and I carved the whole thing and then oh, filled wow. it pink. 
I was going to print the actual thing, but then everyone said that they thought that the block that I had the block art itself was, art. was yeah. kind of more interesting. That's so. phenomenal. I can, I can, I'm, I'm seeing in my head just kind of like that intricate nature type of items that you were, you know, that you were creating. Yeah. And it, I think it was, it, I was sort of thinking about how patterns on, you know, like when you, when you zoom out and look at ice melting, for example, in the oh. ocean, it can have kind of similar organic patterns to, um, if you zoom in with a microscope and look at some organic pattern. And so I was kind of just mixing organic natural patterns on large and really small scales and just kind of playing with scale and um, just drawing inspiration from nature. Nice. So after you finished your IP project, what happened next for you? Since you know so, you dropped all your classes, so obviously I'm sure you took them eventually. <laughs> yeah. So so um, I I actually um so I kind of got super burnt out and I got a bad case of mono. <laughs> oh no. And um, I had to then not take summer classes, which I had originally planned to do to finish up my degree. And um, then from there, I actually kind of had the really depressing feeling. I mean, I'm, it's something that like a lot of students go through and at the time you feel really disappointed, I think with it, but I moved back home with my parents and I didn't know what I was doing next. And I hadn't finished my degree when I thought I was gonna finish my degree. I, I didn't have some awesome career that I thought I was gonna have or at least hoped I would have. And um, so at, at the time I was pretty, and I was still grieving the loss of two of my family members. Um, and at the time it was definitely a lower point, but um, I found a job in New Haven and it was a personal assistant slash graphic designer. And I kind of just lived with my parents and did this job where I was doing kind of like a lot of um, grunt work, I just basically anything that this guy needed, I did. And, and okay. I, and I also just did some of his graphic design and for his company. And, um, and then my mom kind of gave me the kick that I needed to, to finish my degree. I think I, and um, she, she just said like, you know, I, I know you feel bad that you haven't finished your degree. And I think you really need to finish this degree so you can yeah. feel you know, feel good about yourself and yeah, um, close that chapter. <laughs> yeah. And, and she said, and, you know, I know that you kind of left you mission kind of a, a disappointing way. And I want you to finish this, you know, this degree with the happy bang, like a, a good ending. And she said, why don't you sign up for a study abroad program and um, just do something really fun to finish your degree. And so I ended up going to China. I just found I had only six credits left and okay. I had to take credits in anything other than art. It was like all three credits. <laughs> and I found this random program that was learning about Chinese criminal justice in China. <laughs> and I, I thought, why not, <laughs> you know? And I emailed and I said, I see this is degree only. Would you mind taking me? Like, it seems like an interesting topic to me and like, I'll study hard. And, and they said, sure. And um, I actually four pointed it. So I guess I did okay, even though I'm not a criminal justice major, but right. it, it, was, it was super interesting. And um, China was so beautiful and it was like, so, um, healing to close that chapter, like personally, professionally, like it yeah. just was such an amazing experience. Wow. So. That's awesome. I mean, I really love, I'm glad that you had that support system in your life and that your mom was able to, you know, give you that, that kick and that push that you needed. Um, yeah. But I also think that it's really great for just students to hear, especially, you know, students in school right now, like you all have had to deal with COVID. <laughs> 
Yeah, and, um, I can't imagine you know, yeah. all the loss around that and then not being able to like utilize all of your resources on campus. And yeah, um, I no, think and a I, lot of people are going through different types of emotional stressors and traumas and experiences. Totally. And it's really totally. empowering to hear how you were able to kind of go through that experience and still find closure in your own way in terms of your, your undergraduate degree. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I totally agree with that. Um, I mean, my mom has several times kind of given me the push I've needed, but like I also tried to be my own voice that have an inner voice, but, or just at least think of what my mom would say to me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but sometimes, you know, I think people and myself included can tend to um, eliminate, uh, not put themselves forward for things or, yeah quit things because they feel bad about something yeah. or, you know, say no to opportunities for themselves almost. And I think that's the important thing is to keep pushing and let other people tell you no, I think. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and I, I think out of your own way. Oh, yeah, exactly. And I think I, at certain points felt, I, I actually was not even going to apply to UMish in the first place. Oh, wow. And um, I was going to, I called to, I called Karina and I said, hi, like, I'm interested in going to UMish. Like, I'm wondering about, I want to maybe transfer. I'm going to a community college right now. And, and um, she said, well, like, tell me about yourself now. And why don't you just apply now? <laughs> and I, I did, but it's funny because I was about to tell myself self no I wasn't even going to let you mish tell me no I was about to yeah. tell myself no and I'm so glad that Karina kind of said apply now <laughs> <laughs> yeah me too go Karina <laughs> so you had this experience in this you know this amazing healing experience in China did you stay did you come back um, you um know, I, what happened I, next for you professionally so I was there for a couple of months and um, then I came back and um, I actually moved to the UK and I started doing graphic design there. What? And um, <laughs> I was doing it for maybe about a couple years, but I was pretty much only part-time still. And I wasn't even sure that I like loved graphic design at the time. And I also had a part-time job in a cafe. And I kind of, at that point, was about ready to give up on getting having a creative career because I sort of felt like oh I don't I'm not making very much money like I I had to supplement with a cafe job and my cafe job like you know I went on vacation and my boss replaced me while I was gone with applicants I found oh <laughs> no he asked me to post an app he asked me to post a job application like a job opening for him and um and I did, and then when I went on vacation, he used the pool of applicants I had gotten to replace me just because he needed somebody while I was on. So I, I think it made me realize, wow, I'm, you know, I need more skilled labor. I'm extremely replaceable. I mean, it's not the nicest thing to do anyways, but I'm, I'm just <laughs> saying like at the time I was thinking I need to become more employable. And um, at that point, I think it was just like, it made me want to get a, like another degree, I think. And I just decided I might change directions. And um, I ended up um, kind of doing some research and thinking about maybe, maybe I'll go into marketing or like get a business degree and then go into kind of a more creative field of business. So I started looking into programs in the UK and um, I, I ended up uh, finding a program that I really liked um, at Durham University. Okay. And um, Durham University is in the UK. It's kind of in the Northeast. Um, and it's, oh, sorry, my screen just shut me off of Zoom. Oh, You're still God. with us. Okay. <laughs> um, it was just, Adobe trying to update. <laughs> oh, no, you're good. Um, I'm actually, if I can pause you for a moment, because sure. you went from China to the UK. Yes, sorry, yes. That is like 
how did you already have a job lined up for yourself in the UK? Did you just decide to make that move? Like, how did you afford to move from being a full-time student in China to, to the UK? How did you afford such a um, move? I, I had a British boyfriend at the time. So, ah. <laughs> so I, we, my partner at the time, he, you know, he, we, we split rent. So it okay. was, it was a bit easier to afford, but you know, I think, and so I, I had moved there initially for him. And after we broke up, I stayed for the really affordable education in the UK. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's, that's smart. It is cheaper and, than the US, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, yeah. So I, I basically just looked into these programs and I, I found this like really great master's program. And um, I ended up getting my master's and it's a different, they don't have this degree in the US, but it's called a master's of management. So it's okay. just, it's basically for people, it's, it's basically like a, not an MBA because I think MBA, you need a lot of practical experience before. Yeah. It's kind of more of a taught degree, not drawn from experience, but more in research. Like if, if you were to study like a PhD in business, like a lot of times people would get a MIM instead of like a master's in management instead of a MBA. So anyways, I, I got this um, master's in management from the UK. And then um, I, then after my degree was done, I was like, all my family had kind of dissipated all across the US and I didn't know like where was home anymore. Mm. And um, I ended up deciding to um, uh, move to California. And just, I thought I want to be somewhere warm, liberal. <laughs> so you and, were making this decision from leaving the UK after having this degree, after graduating from this degree to go to yes. California? Yeah. All right, you know, I'm going to ask you again, how are you going to afford that move? <laughs> I mean, it was, I was pretty broke, but I, yeah. <laughs> I was pretty broke. I had, um, I did have a a student loan for my master's and I did have a little bit of money left over from that and but I was pretty broke the first month or two um and within two months I got a job um and I wanted as I, I mentioned before I wanted a creative business job but the right. first job I got was um and I, but I was just applying for everything and, right. I mean, you got to make ends meet. So I understand. Right. <laughs> and after I applied for everything and, uh, the, and I had a couple of creative jobs, like product, product manager, which is kind of being like the liaison between the business team and the creative team. I, I had, I had interviews, but I didn't get one at the time. And mm. so I, but the first thing that I got was being a supply chain planner for Fiji water. <laughs> okay. And it was kind of my odd year of being um, in a completely non-creative um, world. And um, I think I, I, it was a really interesting year for me actually. And I learned so much. Um, I first of all, learned a lot of Excel. <laughs> and, okay, great. Uh, uh, I'm really good at Excel now. <laughs> and two, um, I would say that uh, it was interesting because, I mean, I, I really put my mind to do well at that job. And um, I definitely did okay. It's not like I was let go or anything. And I, I worked really hard. I think I did fine at that job. But one thing that was kind of interesting to me is um, I always sort of thought that like going into uh, the creative industry was kind of more of a choice, but I almost working so hard at something that's kind of against my natural skill set mm. um, made me realize like it's it's less of a choice than I think because mm. I think to be really successful at something, I think you need kind of your natural abilities to align with hard work. And yeah. I think for me, it was, I mean, I was, it was swimming upstream, but I swam hard, but, it, but you wanted it. 
right? And I think you yeah. wanting it to work, right? And to sustain yourself, I think that impacts it too. What part of California were you in? Oh, I'm Los Angeles and I'm still in Los Angeles. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And you were in that role for just one year? Yeah. And um, actually kind of what happened was on, I kind of felt like I didn't see a future at this place um, at Fiji. And um, I started going to networking events and kind of just like any, and I, and I started um, just kind of trying to meet people and see like what other kind of roles I could get into. And I met the founders of a startup and they, and I basically started working part-time in addition for them once okay. I was at PG. And- um, Was this a paid part-time position? It was, yes. Okay, great. It was only $20, I think it was $20 an hour at the okay. time. And I mean, it, not bad. Um, yeah, not bad at all. And for, it was like on a, I would do Sundays and Tuesday evenings. And um, I just kind of did everything for them, but because it was a startup, I had more room to kind of try different things with them. Yeah. Like I was doing all sorts of roles. And what was kind of interesting was, so this was how I really got into photography was mm. um, I saw what they were paying for somebody to take their product photos mm -hmm. and the quality of what we were getting back. And I was like, that's really expensive. And I think <laughs> I could do better maybe. <laughs> so nice. I, so I basically thought, you know what? I, and my, my head started spinning like, or my ideas started spinning and I was like, okay, yeah. you know what? I think I'm going to really try to make a business making photos for um companies and um so i actually um spent all my money and i bought equipment and um and you say spent all your money like spent your savings like did you leave they, some to afford rent <laughs> well i mean savings and then I a couple times had to call my parents and ask them to yeah. help me with my rent which I'm lucky honestly that I'm in a position where like my parents were able to help me yeah, with that's great. that's great but I mean I I basically I spent all of my savings on um oh and actually my parents did give me some initial money too to help me with the move started. And um, I, I purchased um, a camera, lights, uh, like stands, and um, and I took five um, photos that I thought were good. I I got, pro I just got random products, and they weren't my clients or anything. And I got just five five photos that I liked, and I printed them out on a flyer, and then. I went to an expo, a product expo, and I just handed out these flyers with my information wow. on it. And I just went from kind of like table to table and hi, my name is Millie. I do product photography. Here's some of my work. Wow. Uh, I'd love to talk to you more about it. And, and basically from that, I got a few clients um, and it kind of just went on from there. And and then I started doing stop motion animations just because um, I just started playing around with taking multiple photos <laughs> and, yeah. and um, got really into stop motion animation. And um, I, you know, slowly in the beginning, I was working so much and making almost no money. And, um, and I kept, and I, you know, have gradually raised my prices, realized what kind of works, what doesn't. And, now I have raised my prices up to, like I, I mean I think I started at $40 a photograph which is way too low don't ever charge that <laughs> and um now I I do um starting 220 for one photograph so it's it's really kind of like 
I've, I've grown my company quite a bit and um what i year did you start um i think it was oh hello yes i you froze just for a moment <laughs> okay uh, i think it was 2018, 2018. january 2018. okay So, um, and um, at, in the beginning, um, I, I was really fortunate, but my brother works as a gaffer, which is lighting and electric for film. Oh, and in the beginning, was... my brother, um, so sweet, but he spent so much time showing me how to light things. And um, just really, I mean, basically I had a lot of help from him where he, he was showing me just kind of the technical aspects of lighting. And, um, and I, I mean, the first year, I think, oh man, I, I think I only, I, I made like very little money, like, and I was working, I was exhausted. And then I Were raised, you still working for the, um, for the startup as well. They became a client of mine. Nice. And yeah. Okay. And then when I raised my prices, they left, <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> That's you know, what happens with growth. Some people come yeah. with me, some people don't. That's all right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, but it was, it, yeah, it was, it was, it, I, I've changed things a lot in my business, like as time went on, but um, I would, I would say that uh, the first year was kind of just exhausting. I didn't have my pricing right. I was letting clients kind of, I was being a pushover a bit. I was yeah. <laughs> letting clients run my schedule in my life. At yeah. a certain point, I was letting, I, an East Coast client wanted me to um, post photos to her Instagram at 8 a.m. Eastern time. So I would wake up at 5 a.m., post a oh, photo, wow. and go back to sleep. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, just, and just but doing, you were in the process of learning your boundaries and just how you wanted to even function as an entrepreneur and as a exactly. So I mean, those are the growing pains. Yeah, and and then yeah, and I I just continued to kind of reach out to clients, and I um got my first big client just from reaching out on by email. And, nice. And um, it was a Clorox owned vitamins brand. And they were looking to dump some money to get it out of their marketing budget. And ah. I was really, <laughs> and, um, great opportunity. They, yeah, it was great. And they were said, okay, can we buy a hundred photos and 12 stop motions from you? And I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I tried not to like shriek on the phone, yeah. <laughs> but, um, I tried to act like that's just like a normal, like normal. Yeah, you got to keep like, cool. oh, yeah. you know, you can yeah, be, sure. Be your happy dance when you get off the phone. <laughs> and um, I got like a, a studio space and it was, it was actually attached to um, like a, a church. And so we had to use the restroom like next door in the church and like the club. The cl one of the Clorox uh, marketing people was sent to like the studio. <laughs> oh, can I use your bathroom? I'm like, yeah, you're gonna have to come into this church. But <laughs> uh, it was, but um, it was like a great experience. How did how did how did these experiences shape where you are now? Like, how do you describe uh, yourself in your creative practice and in your business now? I would say that um, I think, I mean, I think you shouldn't let other, I, I guess you shouldn't let other people, even clients make you feel like you're not good at what you do or that, I, I guess I, I would say that I, I think I run things with a lot more confidence that I'm good at what I do. And so I think because I have that confidence I'm more able to kind of set my boundaries and I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not, um, when I'm, I'm not letting clients put arbitrary 
internal deadlines on me that make me pull all nighters, you know, yeah. um, which I used to do in the beginning. I used to pull all nighters all the time. And um, it's silly. It's like, I don't, for your internal, you know, deadline. Yeah. I, I, I guess I, I kind of say, you know, I can get this to you this quickly, but like, you're going to have to pay for it or, you yeah. know, um, stuff. Yeah. or if somebody else makes a mistake and doesn't get me the right things that I need in time, I'm, you know, I, I'll say, you know, I, I think that um, I'm better at communicating with clients. Like, you know, you, you say you want this, but I just l- letting you know that it's probably not going to look great or you know right I I think that before I would just do whatever the clients said and then kind of scramble to pick up the pieces or if something didn't work out to redo you learn how to self-advocate exactly yeah yeah so to this to this day are you actively still doing photography and stop motion in your business have you dropped any of those have you added services um I think that well I do both but stop motions tend to sell better. So usually photography ends up being kind of an add-on. Okay. I think a lot of people can do photography, not as many people can do stop motion animation because it's kind of yeah. a more specialized skill. And um, even photographers, they'll make maybe like little five frame GIFs. But if you try to make, you know, a 300 frame something with a strobe light, you're going to you need different equipment basically. So if you'll get kind of this um, flicker effect because strobe lights kind of flash at different brightness each time. And so it's gonna kind of almost, if you're like epileptic, I I bet it could give you a seizure (laughs) to see like stop motions that are made with a strobe light. So it's totally different. It's an investment. There's a higher barrier to entry, which seems like a bad thing, but sometimes it's a good thing because if yeah. you're serious about something, you're not going to just have like a hobbyist, yeah. you know, you're like um, animator who's going to spend 3000 on a light, you know. And are you, um, are you a hundred percent in this business at this point? Are you still working other jobs for other employers and you're doing this business at the same time? Or are you just only working in your business? So I am working like technically my business could be like a hundred percent full-time career. Like it could be a full-time career. The one thing is that I actually have in the very beginning, I started assisting a photographer that has been in the industry for 10 years and and she's become my mentor. And I just like really look up to her and I honestly, at this point, don't really even do it for the money. I just like learn so much. I basically still probably 10% of my time spent assisting this photographer. And it's just because I learned so much from her and I really enjoy kind of getting out of the, my house and not just like, I, I used to kind of just be like a hundred percent. Um, I mean, I do, I do hire people occasionally, but sometimes I'm working alone a lot and it can get kind of lonely. (laughs) And so sometimes it's nice for me to work on these bigger jobs, um, with huge crew so that I kind of get some human interaction. And then I, I just love learning from Andrea, who's been my mentor. And, um, so she's, she's been doing it for about 10 years and, um, she, she, um, is like an incredible photographer. And I just like see how she interacts with the clients and um, just how she handles when things go wrong and how um, she, like just her creative approach. And I just have learned so much, so. Now I'm a big believer that any and all creatives, you know, just choosing a career in a creative field, you're also choosing um, to be an entrepreneur and a business owner because your skill set and your services that you're offering is the business, Uh whether you work an employer or working independently with your own business. Um, And you've obviously elected to have your own business. So I'm just curious, you know, 
is a lot of the a lot of the kind of operational things with running a business, you know, from your taxes to getting your business license <laughs> to, you know, hiring people. Like, did you get experience or knowledge learning how to handle those things because of your master program? Did you learn that? Did you learn some of those things from the a person you've been assisting who's kind of become your mentor? Where did you kind of, you know, gain some of those skills to navigate how to actually operate your business? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I, so I would say that I don't, I don't think people necessarily need like a master's in business um, to do this sort of thing. Like, I think that you can self-educate, um, but I would say that I had a pretty strong, I, not realistic business brain before, <laughs> <laughs> before, and I think it kind of did help change um, my thinking. Um, it's funny because I even remember John like showing me a business program in art school. So I, it's kind of funny. I feel like he almost had an I, idea like that it would be helpful to me or I might be interested before I knew. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, um, I, I think that sometimes I can get so excited about something creative that I just kind of like if I'm super excited to do something, I just want to do it and I don't like and I, I also, like I said, didn't have confidence in what I was offering. So I think I would undersell myself and um, ask for too little and be so excited I would put more into it. And um, it was, I think that like business school definitely made me think about kind of the costs and what you're bringing in and what you're taking out. And I, I think that um, also uh, working in the industry also really helps because you see some numbers can sound really large and um, you just see how to like companies, they're really not. <laughs> So I like for, and, and also when I, okay. So when I work, work for Andrea, mm -hmm. she always is making sure that you're not doing unpaid work. So for example, right. in an upcoming thing that I'm assisting her in, they're planning to, they asked if they could use my hand in one of the photos. And she said without even, um, without even, asking me, she, she said, well, maybe you should pay Millie like an extra hundred if you're going to use her hand because she might have to like nail polish her hands. And she's yeah. always kind of making sure like I, and <laughs> so I'm That's getting great. paid next week, a hundred bucks to paint my nails. But <laughs> I'm just saying, um, yeah, it, and the company is like, yeah, okay, sure. And um, they don't even think about it. But, you know, I would feel at certain points, I might've felt ridiculous saying, telling a company like, well, if you want to use my hand, it's a hundred bucks, <laughs> you know, but um, at the same time, it's, it's a great, that's so great that you have a mentor who's even showcasing that to you Yeah, because it's the right thing to do. Right. You know, if they didn't have a hand in the room that they were interested in, they would need to go to an agency and pay your hand model. Yeah, hand, right? exactly. So they are actually saving a lot of money in the fact that you know, I'm going to be lotioning money. and painting my own hand. And, um, I, but, and, and she's always making, you know, I, whenever I work with her, I'm always getting a per diem. I'm always getting, um, well, at, if I'm working out of town, I'm getting her yeah. mileage hotel per diem. And, yeah. and, and it, if there's anything I need to do before the shoot, I'm getting paid for it. Like, and, um, I think that's pretty, um, like important and I, I you you really notice how companies really don't sweat that kind of stuff at least the right companies yeah so now you've been you've had your business for three years now then right yeah. and um going into four mm -hmm. and you're still in Los Angeles you're still based in Los Angeles yes and, and would I, you, go for go sorry go ahead I'm sorry but I and I can actually be based anywhere um oh I'm not sure hear me yes I hear you uh can you hear me yes okay um 
I, you know, I was kind of thinking like, man, I don't need to live in such an expensive city for what I'm doing because clients send me their product. And then I met my fiance who's stuck in LA. So I'm stuck. I'm stuck there now, but I, I don't need to be. So, okay. Nice. Well, that was a part of my next question is if uh, your business, even since you said, you know, working with that photographer um, is really just a great educational experience for you and not necessarily for the money. Um, so is that safe to assume that your business is profitable and booming and, yes. you know, you feel definitely secure and sustained on your own? Definitely. Yeah. That's incredible. Um, Kudos yeah. To the part Thanks. The first I mean, three years in business and to be able to say that and live in LA is a really big <laughs> deal. Um, that is, is not a small feat. So I mean, I can, I can, yeah. So that I would say that the first year I barely scraped by, it was rough, but like I said, I was charging too little. I was being too much of a pushover. I was getting, burning myself out. The second year, I would say that I, um, I, got some large contracts and um i definitely think it, it my overhead was kind of high because i had this like large studio space but then i figured out if i just got a bigger apartment and had another room as my studio i could actually make or like i could actually save on overhead yeah and, and right um, off that studio space in your apartment exactly and <laughs> um and i also had more people doing work for me now I just kind of subcontract on like when I need it and okay. um so my income has stayed higher but my overhead has gone down so you but you can you can make really good money in commercial photography um you really can and the more you do freelance you end up having repeat clients and regular things like I have like certain jobs where I do monthly work for them. And um, some of them are like retainers, but some of them are retainer, like as in a, a monthly contract where I produce eight photos for them a month for this price or something. They continue um, to pay you monthly. Yes. So that's retainers are really nice because um, it's kind of income I know I'll have. Um, yeah. But uh, then also you can actually get really regular work that's not retainers like people still might be coming to you on a quarterly basis a monthly basis and um you you can make really good money as long as you set your boundaries <laughs> appropriately with clients and set your prices and i guess work at being good at what you do it's yeah we do have a question so far, um, and for anybody else that's interested, we've got just about 14 minutes left, so it's a great time to drop your questions, you know, that you've got so you can get them answered. Um, Jordan wants to know, would you say that photography is more lucrative when coupled with another career? Oh, you can make, I mean, I, I guess I don't fully, I, I would say no. I mean, maybe she's, uh, uh, maybe they're asking because I mentioned the thing about stop motion animation. Mm -hmm. um, no, you can make good money. Um, I know photographers who make day rates of $2,500 a day, which wow. is, so, I mean, literally they work 10 days a month and then they might literally be making 25K. Yeah. And, and it takes, I mean, a lot of dedication and maybe 10 years or something to get there, but I mean, it's not crazy. I mean, and then there's all the ranges in between of what you'd be making until you got there, which can be quite decent <laughs> too. Um, well, also just my backgrounds in photography too. Um, I, I too also know lots of photographers, not even in the commercial space, even in the product photography space too. Um, headshots, I mean, it really, you right. name it. Um, yeah. There's a niche and it's really more about uh, your craft, right? And then what mm -hmm. you do and how you're marketing yourself. Uh, Mindy wants to know, do you see yourself changing careers again in the future? Or do you think that you're set with your current path for a while? Great question, Mindy. <laughs> um, I really love what I do and I 
see myself at least doing this for a while. Awesome. <laughs> I, I do love it. Um, I think one thing I didn't really get to mention before is I love kind of the tedious nature of, you know, working with my hands. And I don't think I'm like a photography nerd. Like some people, like some people get really into the kind of the, like the lighting and the settings of the camera and whatnot. I kind of am more interested, I guess, almost in, because I'm a one man operation, like, I guess I love kind of the creative, like the coming up with the concepts, like the creative directing and the building of the photo set. And then I, I capture it. And then I feel like that's a way that I can make money working with my hands and being tedious. Like I, it's, it's actually, I mean, I'm not, I'm not about here. Like, I'm not here to slam other, you know, fields of art, but like, it's really hard, I think, to make money in certain industries where you're selling to people, not to businesses. And you're doing something very time consuming and, and on the global market where there's lower costs of living. It's kind of hard to compete with handwork and that, I mean, the fact that you can probably go to H&M and buy something that has like tedious hand embroidery for like $15, like we're screwed kind of. And, um, and it's a different type of market, right? It's a so different like type of market. Person that's going to pay the, the full real price for like something handcrafted by an exactly. artist is very different than those who would be shopping at H&M. But I definitely hear you. No, I agree with I agree with you. And I'm not trying to say you can't make money in those industries. All I'm trying to say is for me, like it was a lot easier to spend a lot of time to build something. Like I sometimes have made shapes out of turmeric or turmeric and and then um, photographed it. And it might have taken me a long time, but if I photograph it, then I can sell it to a company for a good rate. Whereas if I, yeah. if I spend a lot of time, I think people don't always know what goes into something and marketing, I, I think for people that are heads of marketing, they know and they will pay for it. So I, wanna, I think it's a really, oh, I want to just jump ahead. in real quick. Yeah. Um, first of all, Millicent, your journey is so amazing from China to the UK to grad oh. school to, I don't know what I'm doing next to, oh, <laughs> hey, I can do product photography. <laughs> you know, it's definitely not a straight line and it's just no. completely fascinating. And I think students can gain a lot from hearing about how life in fact is not linear um, right. I also want to say, because of course I knew you as a student, um, your level of confidence in yourself and what you can in fact achieve in your life is so amazing. Um, okay. Because as a student, I think you were very unsure a lot of the time. And now you're just this wonderful, productive, amazing human. <laughs> Oh, thank you. <laughs> so for all of you, like 10 years from now, um, please do this so I can see how you turned out. Um, the, the other thing I want to do is point out that in the chat, I did drop a link to the University of Michigan Masters of Management program, mm -hmm. which is a 10 month program. And I think it's very helpful for creative people who are like, I don't really want an MBA, but I want to learn more about business mm -hmm. and how business works. So I think that, you know, Millie's program um, in the UK is a great example of, well, you don't have to do that. You could do this other thing and learn what you need to learn if you didn't learn it right. while you're an undergrad student. So I wanted to make sure people saw that in the chat. Um, also in the chat, please give us feedback. There's a link to um, an assessment survey so that we can get your feedback on the From Here to There program. Um, and so we're always looking for ways to improve. So if you can just take a couple minutes to make sure that you do that, that would be absolutely incredible. Um, and Stephanie, I'm so glad that you brought up that you too are a photographer. <laughs> um, and I think that, you know, 
maybe when we're done today, the two of you should get together and compare notes <laughs> <laughs> around, okay, well, this is how I approach it. No, this is how I approach it. <laughs> offline, if you want to you know, chit chat a bit more, that would be so cool, I think. I think my favorite thing with all of these sessions that we've been able to do is that, you know, everyone is doing it a little bit differently. And the benefit is that you can hear and learn from everyone's individual stories. You know, there is no straight direct path. Um, you know, you can pull pieces from Millie's journey and see what applies to yours. You can pull pieces from other people's journeys and figure it out as you go, especially in these industries where things are changing so frequently and so common, right? Um, so the technology is changing, the demand is changing, experiences and, you know, what people are interested in are changing. Um, but also, if I, I don't know if you've noticed this, Millie, but did you see where you came full circle from your IP project to what you're doing now? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I really love to witness those kinds of moments, and I think that they happen yeah. more frequently, but it takes some self-reflection or maybe an opportunity to, like, I don't know, tell your whole life story, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> to like, say it out loud and hear it, but I really do think that creatives we are created doing what we're meant to do, but they might not just look or feel the same way when we begin compared right. to where you end up. And this is just where you are right now, right? You mm -hmm. might end up doing even larger, bigger, grander stop motions, or maybe you might find another way to work with your hands in small, tedious, you know, ways to create larger yeah. things. But yeah. I think it's really fun to just identify um, these interests that you have, even in the early parts, you know, of your education yeah. and your life and see where it I, applies later on. Yeah, it was actually kind of, um, I, I agree with you. I, I think it, I felt generally creative and I felt kind of strange that I didn't have something that particularly called out to me more than the other things. I just knew I loved creating. It wasn't medium specific, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I guess Technique that's specific. It, exactly. Yeah. yeah. It was, it was more just, I loved kind of the process of making and, um, I, I guess I felt kind of lost in that sense because at UMish, I, I think some people were clearly in one direction and, um, having a wide range of skills can be very useful in certain yeah. industries. Yeah. Especially in non-traditional industries too, where, you know, creatives are in demand everywhere, not just at art yeah. agencies, not just for creative businesses, like everyone, mm -hmm. Whirlpool, Google, like every yes. tech company, every furniture company, like everything is looking mm -hmm. for a creative. Um, so yeah, so be able to know where you can apply those different skills and things to really utilize yourself and you're definitely a great product of an interdisciplinary program right so even yeah. though you might have had classmates that were yeah. very much so in one direction yeah that is a great benefit of, of being in an interdisciplinary in an interdisciplinary program because you're able to really get to know so many different skill sets that you can have in that tool belt to enter the world with um yeah and I think that's a really great example you know your work is not medium specific you know you can do what you're doing with a lot of different yeah. tools um, and I think that just opens you up to more opportunities thank you yeah, yeah I awesome. agree. so um, yeah go gonna wrap up in just a couple minutes um Millie if if students remember this is recorded so it's not just the, the people who are here with us now <laughs> um if if students would like to be in touch with you Yes. Um, what is the best way for, oh, hi, dog. Um, what, is, what is the best way for them to be in touch? Uh, they can email me at mwibert at gmail.com. Or they can text me at 310-592-0992. <laughs> Great. Great. Um, I've enjoyed talking to some students in the past that came out to California um, nice. with Brian. Yeah. Yeah, and I have I have Millie's email, so don't worry if you can get that. I have it. 
And we're huge on mentorship and obviously you're enjoying it, you know, a, a similar mentor experience. So anybody listening and watching this, if you know, you see a mentor in Millie, definitely reach yeah, out. Yeah, definitely reach out. And can I actually just say something really quick? Yeah, um, go for it. I forgot to say how I made acquaintance ship with Andrea, which was, I actually saw on LinkedIn that Alice McCarthy went to UMish and she worked at an agency called Frank Collective. And mm-hmm. I messaged her on LinkedIn and I, and I didn't even know Alice from UMish. I never had a, the same class as her ever. And I just messaged Alice on, on LinkedIn and I said, hey, I see you went to UMish Art School. So did I, I was reaching out because I'd love to work with Frank, Frank Collective. And she said, actually, um, we have like a shoot for Barefoot Wine coming up. And if you'd like to assist, um, we'd be like, maybe we could talk about it. And we met up and we got coffee and um, she gave me just this like assistantship job. And that's, I assisted Andrea who was shooting for this barefoot wine shoot. And, um, and it was all because I reached out to a former Umish alum and I, I, who I didn't even know. And I think that, um, I don't, I, I think that a lot of people, not everyone, but most people are happy to help people. And I think even if you have the slightest connection to someone, you might as well reach out. And the worst that could happen is that they just don't respond or say no. Right. But I'm so glad you remembered to add that. And I think it speaks to what you were saying before about just letting somebody else say no and, you know, giving yourself, spending on yourself. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Just betting on yourself. um, I think it's really great. I'm so glad you're able to do that and definitely encourage all of you all look up Millicent on LinkedIn. Let's get connected. Uh, Make sure you study abroad. (laughs) <laughs> yes, make sure you're connected with me. Just be connected to everyone because you never know who's going to have that connection to help make that introduction for you. Thank you, Millie, so much Thank for you. chatting with us. And uh, congratulations on an amazing career and three years oh, in business. Thank you. And uh, have a great night. Thank you all so much for Thank listening you. and taking part in From Here to There. <laughs> Bye. Millie's email is now in the chat. Um, so hopefully everybody can access that. Um, Stephanie, you are like the best interviewer ever. Thank yeah, you thank so you. much <laughs> for from here to there for this fall term. Everybody who's on now and who reads my Friday emails, um, I'll be announcing the lineup for the winter term uh, very okay. soon. And Stephanie will return to interview our other amazing alums. And for anybody who doesn't realize it, Stephanie is in fact an alum of our MFA program. (laughs) Oh, cool. So it's all in the family, guys. It is. (laughs) And Millie, one more time, just thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, So wonderful to to see you again and to be with you. Oh, thank you. Um, Everybody, thank you. Uh, Have a great night. Bye.